Thanks for joining us for the Las Cruces mayoral debate. I'm Fred Martino along with Walt Rubel and Sylvia Uloa of the Las Cruces Sun News. We welcome our candidates, Mayor Ken Miyagashima, Gina Montoya Ortega and City Councilor Miguel Silva. The candidates will have one minute to answer questions posed to them. The other two candidates will then have 30 seconds each to respond. Following that, the panelists who asked the question may request further clarification. Our first question is for Mayor Ken Miyagashima and it is from Walt Rubel. Mayor Miyagashima, I want to start with a three-part question about the CAFE initiative uh, to increase the minimum wage. My first question on that is why did you vote against putting that on the ballot? The second part of that question is do you believe CAFE and more specifically the volunteers who are out there gathering the petitions were treated fairly in that process? And the third question is in response to a column that was printed last week in our paper. Were you pressured to change your position on that by Don Kurtz or anybody else with the Progressive Voters Alliance? Okay, so the first question was uh, my position on the minimum wage. Initially, I felt that we could have changed it a little bit. Um, that's why I was, I was trying to work out a compromise. Then I quick, quickly realized it was probably the best thing to do is to honor the, the voters and the, the petition. That's why I uh, decided to support that and move forward with it, try to keep it intact. And one of the things that happened, and this will answer your question number three, was uh, my middle son was doing a project at Centennial High School on the need for life insurance of all things. And so we were going through a, a, a project and we were talking about what would happen if he if he passed away and he had a wife and two children. And we basically summed it up that he was, he wouldn't, she would have to have a, a minimum wage job. And then after he ran out of money, he asked, well, what's she gonna do? I said, she's gonna have to get another job. And so it was that situation right there, plus the testimony of many of the people there at the city council chambers that made me change my mind. And I realized that and I moved forward with that uh, conviction. Good. Uh, Ms. Ortega, you obviously didn't have a vote on that issue, but did you, you did watch that unfold and you will potentially be impacted as a business owner. What are your thoughts about how that whole process played um, out? Yes, first of all, um, I didn't have a vote, neither did the almost 100,000 of us here in Las Cruces. Um, so yeah, personally, I don't think it, it should have gone to the voters. That was the other option. Um, as far as the volunteers on the, that got the petitions, I'm not sure exactly you know, how that goes. And as far as the le next question, was he pressured by Don Kurtz? Um, I, I'm not a politician, never have been, don't care to be one. But what little I have, ha I have heard from people that are more involved in the politics, I heard that that was one of the influencing uh, de uh, decisions. Okay, and, and uh, Councilor Silva, you, you did have a vote on that issue. Uh, you you, you uh, voted in opposition to, well actually you, you voted along with Mayor Miyagashima the first time around and then in opposition later on. Can you talk about your votes on that Well, I think my issue? voting was very consistent on that uh, topic in that out of the nine votes total, I voted seven to raise minimum wage. Um, I was at the very beginning, at the forefront in April, trying, I brought CAFE and the Chamber of Commerce to the table to negotiate. I even met with uh, Ms. Sylvia over here at one point to inform her and inform the Sun News that we were trying to negotiate a settlement. Unfortunately, it did not work. Um, I felt that CAFE had a different agenda at hand. And so I think that we had to move forward with what was presented in front of us, and that was to raise minimum wage. Uh, and that was what the initiative was about. It wasn't about going before the voters, it was about raising minimum wage. And so I would think I, my voting record was very consistent on that, on that topic. Okay. Mrs. Uh, Ortega, as co-owner of a business that could be affected by the minimum wage, would you recuse yourself from any minimum wage votes before the council if elected? Yes or no and why? Well, I would think that being a business owner that, yes, if it, um, if it would affect the rest of the people, I would definitely, definitely do that. Okay. Councillor Silva, what is your position on this? Do you believe that uh, folks who could be directly or indirectly affected by votes such as minimum wage should recuse themselves if it comes before them? I don't know. Can you explain the question? What do you mean recuse themselves? You mean as Not, a votes. Not votes. Not vote. Not um, cast a vote. Well, I, you know, I, I don't have a business or anything, so I don't know how, I mean, my vote I think would be one that I think would be reflective of the community. And again, uh, as stated before, I was very diligent in going out and researching and listening to both sides. 
uh, of that argument. So um, I don't feel that I would recuse myself. There would be no reason for me to recuse myself on uh, the minimum wage. Mayor Miyagashima, your thoughts on this? My average salary for my employees is between 15 and 17 dollars an hour, and I agree. If it did some, if it was something that would directly affect me, I would recuse myself. But that's the reason why I haven't. Okay, Sylvia. Okay, this uh, question is for uh, Councillor Silva. Um, Miguel, your first proposal on the minimum wage would actually have lowered the wage by 50 cents for workers who get health insurance uh, on the job. Uh, was that allowed in state and federal law? And why did you support lowering the minimum wage for um, for workers? I don't believe mine ever lowered it, um, because if anything, we have to meet the, the federal minimum level. Um, if when you say lowered, I don't know if you were talking about lower between the eight and the eight twenty-five. I, I think it was there. Were, you guys had proposed a one one dollar. Uh, essentially, 50 like fifty cents or fifty cents. Uh, the, the proposal was that if uh, if employers offered health insurance through the, oh, their yes, job, that you would did, actually we, lower. We the did offer that, and that pretty much mirrored the Albuquerque uh, minimum wage ordinance, who oh. offered uh, employers the opportunity if they were to offer health care, health care, or certain child care services, mm -hmm. then they could pay a, a lower rate, which is still above the minimum, the federal level. Um, but it was to assist employers in, with their employees and how they work with their employees. Okay. Um, well, Mayor Miyagi-Shima, what, uh, what did you think about that idea of giving people or giving employers an option for uh, or a, a waiver for providing health care? Right. Well, one of the things that, that recently came out, of course, was the Affordable Care Act and, and the requirement that certain um, businesses with, uh, I think it's 50 employees or more, mm -hmm. are required to have health insurance. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I did notice that a couple of our communities up north, Albuquerque, Santa Fe, did have that inclusion about uh, credit for health insurance and or, I believe, child care as well. Mm -hmm. That was something there that I was willing to entertain. Okay. And Mrs. Mon uh, Mrs. Ortega, is there um, anything you'd like to add as far as providing health insurance for well, your, being that, your employees? Well, you know, that was one of the options to help these um, employers, you know, it's either this or that. Well, yeah, but to um, actually, you know, say that we're going to go off of a model of Albuquerque or Santa Fe, I don't think that's, to me, that just doesn't make sense to be able to use those as co to compare. And why not? Uh, because Albuquerque and Santa Fe are bigger cities, more uh, productive cities, uh, more income, more jobs just a, a more sustainable community. Is that something you would like Las Cruces to emulate, however? Uh, not as big, yes, but I think Las Cruces definitely does need more jobs mm -hmm. um, and more business friendly. Yep. Okay, uh, our first question this time is, is uh, for Ms. Ortega. Uh, you have said that one of the main reasons that you're running is because you don't believe the current city council is listening enough to the voters. Yes. Uh, have you yourself attended any of the, the charrettes or the, uh, the other public input meetings that have been held for downtown or for other issues? And is your concern that there's not enough opportunity or that they're, they're, they're providing opportunity but just not then following through? Um, I think that there hasn't been enough opportunity. A perfect example is that the current city council meetings are held at one o'clock. Um, so personally, like me as a business owner, at one o'clock is not convenient. And in talking to other people, uh, one o'clock meetings, they said, have not been convenient. They would like for their voices to be heard, and one o'clock is not a convenient time. Um, have I participated in some of the other meetings that, no, I have not. Once again, being a business owner, there's a lot of things that I've had to not be able to do, such as even missing weddings or funerals or rosaries, you know, because of our work schedule, so. Okay. Councilor Silva, I, I'm sure you've heard this uh, as well, the, the complaint that there isn't enough, uh, that you guys aren't listening enough to the voters. Uh, do you see that as an issue of not enough opportunity, or is that an issue of uh, there's plenty of opportunity, but you're just not doing what the voters are, are asking I've, you to do? I, I feel we provide plenty of opportunity. I know that this district one city councilor, I, ho I host two meetings per year, one in the spring and one in the fall, where we send out notices to all the residents or all the households in the district. And so sometimes they're well attended, sometimes they're not so attended. Um, and so I've made an effort to go out and listen and host community meetings and listen to my district one residents. Um, also on some very, some of the more tenacious issues that we've come before us, the minimum wage being one, um, the farmer's market when we were privatizing the farmer's market, 
uh, the police review board. I went out and brought opposing people to the table to work it out and listen to each other. And so um, I've always made it a point to go out and listen to both sides or uh, listen to the story from the resident's point of perspective. And, and, and Mayor Miyagashima, I did want you to you know, respond specifically, if you could, to the, the notion that the meetings are held when most in the afternoon when most people are at work, as well as your thoughts on increasing public participation. Sure. Actually, we did <coughs> do a test uh, one time, one year, where we actually had night meetings every quarter. And it was determined that actually attendance was, was actually a little bit less uh, than, than when we had them during the day. We tried it for a whole year. Every we would have our regular meetings, and then every quarter, I don't know if it's uh, March and June and, and uh, September and December, we would have one at night. <clears throat> so it didn't really increase participation. In fact, we, we noticed it may have even decreased a little bit, so we went back to the regular schedule. But we've been at different uh, uh, time periods, 1 o'clock. Uh, when I first started, it was 5 o'clock. Uh, and then a lot of times we would have meetings that would last a lot of times till 11, 12 o'clock in the morning or 12 a.m. And so we'd have complaints on the other side that they last too long mm -hmm. because they have to get up for the next morning. So we've tried different things to be inclusive. Uh, one of the other things I'd like to say is uh, I too have district meetings, to, well, citywide meetings twice a year, but also we do community surveys and we listen to the public this way. Uh, we feel that we've been very attentive to, oh. to our residents. Okay. And, uh, Thank you. Councilor Silva, you were in the majority vote to change the minimum wage ordinance drafted by CAFE after initially approving it. Should the charter be changed to automatically put valid citizen initiatives on the ballot, yes or no, and why? No. And the reason being is what happens if a, le a piece of legislation comes before us that uh, is not very good legislation? And that was one of the things that happened with that CAFE legislation. If you looked at the legislation, there was no provision in there for employees to um, attain or, or receive funds that were not paid to them. So that had to be fixed. Um, there's no way I think I could, we could have, or at least I could have supported a piece of legislation that wouldn't have allowed uh, uh, an employee to not receive funds that were not due to them. Aside so, from legal issues, uh, would you be okay with changing? Well, when the you charter? pass an ordinance, that's we're passing a legal document. I mean, no, that's I mean, the law. in other words, if it was written in such a way that uh, if it changes could be made to address legal challenges, uh, but voters would get to cast their ballots on on the issues. It would depend on what's in front of us, Fred. I, I, that's, I mean. I take each vote as they come, one by one. So it would depend on what piece of legislation was in front of me. Okay. Mayor Miyagashima, I want you to weigh in on this as well. Your thoughts on uh, changing the uh, city charter where if a, if a valid citizen initiative comes forward and there are no legal problems with that initiative, should that charter be changed so that instead of the council voting on it, the citizens would vote? Yes, and that's where uh, the this, this council messed up. <clears throat> we need to have language in the charter that when those residents, those 6,000 petitioners, registered voters, brought some to the, to the council, we need to honor that. Uh, that's no difference than an election. I mean, you've got people writing on the petition saying that this is what we want, and so I would be supportive of it. Uh, in fact, I'd I went, would go so far to say we couldn't change it within a year after it's implemented. Okay. Mrs. Ortega, <coughs> your thought? I would definitely think that the char charter does need to be looked at, and especially if it is a valid, um, something that the voters need to look at. Um, you know, minimum wage, I mean, you know, the seven people that made the decision, none of them were affected by that. They didn't ask the rest of the people that had to foot the bill. So I definitely think that it's something that the citizens should, their voice should be heard. Okay. So All right. Um, Mayor Miyagishima, uh, it's been suggested by the head of a statewide business group that a recent bond issue passed by the city and supported by the increase in the gross receipts tax is proof that the city now has more money than it knows what to do with. How do you respond to that? And I can't show you figures? I can't show you, um, mm -hmm. am I allowed to or not? Well, the, the, the rules were that <laughs> okay, you're supposed I thought. to have props. But, yeah. uh, okay. ba basically, mm -hmm. it is true that um, uh, the, mon the city will have more revenue in the first 15 years, mm -hmm. but it, I have to point out that it also starts to decline because of food and medicine not being taxed, you're gonna see the city having less and less money. Now, 15, I think in year 18, it actually crosses. That's where we'll start losing money. This is 
above and beyond all the money that's collected. Mm -hmm. It's a tough issue, one that we were just forced to, to be placed in because of the fact that the state um, legislature and the administration uh, retracted their hold harmless clause. Mm -hmm. And after we did this, we had seven other cities follow suit. They recognized that this has to be done to take 10% of your operating budget, and we have been preparing for it. We were, we were reducing our spending year after year, but we were not expecting it to be hit all at once just like this. Okay. Um, Mrs. Ortega, what, do you, what is your thought about um, the city collecting more in the short term than it really needed to to make up for the cuts in home health? Well, being that Las Cruces, I mean, we were just recently ranked the top 25th poorest city in the nation. Um, that right there in itself says, you know, people don't, we don't have 15 years you know, of waiting. I mean, people are tr struggling to survive every day now. So, yeah, I, I don't believe they should have passed that GRT. Not for something that's going to affect us 15 years down the road. Um, Miguel, uh, do you um, do you support the way that the city has is, uh, is looking to spend this money that they that they've collected? Well, for starters, uh, to answer the question that was asked my two previous colleagues. Um, that was one again that I didn't vote. I mm -hmm. voted no, and I was the only no vote because it should have gone before the voters. Uh, it taxed the, the gross receipt tax as presented, and I was also one of the only council, one of two other councilors who went to the county to oppose the rate increase at the county level as well. Mm -hmm. um, how we're investing it now is is a matter of again of economic development. I know we're looking at uh, infrastructure. But the fact that we did not earmark it before we voted on it, that had big, I can, had big concerns regarding that. And also, we are still debating how to invest it. So uh, okay. those are concerns that I still have. Okay, thank you. And my, my next question happens to follow up on that, and it is for Councillor Silva. You, you had said at another forum, and you said just now, that one of your primary concerns was that the money hadn't been earmarked correctly, you, you didn't believe. If that had been done, and, and if, I, I'm assuming maybe one of your concerns was that it was passed too quickly, if that's not the case, let me know. I guess my question is, if the city had waited, and if the earmark process had been done properly, would you then have supported it, or would you still have voted against that, that increase? That's one, again, I think, I, actually, more than anything, it should have gone before the voters, because I think the voters should have had ultimate say on whether we should raise the taxes or not. Okay. Um, Mayor Miyagashima, um, sure. your thought on, on this idea that uh, could it have been put to the voters? I know that that was something that was debated and there were some legal questions about whether under state law you were allowed to do that. Yes, it could have been. Uh, the legislature wrote in the language that this was one that didn't, did not need to be, uh, but we still treated it like an election. I had six different district meetings to meet with the residents and explain to them the reason why this was needed. Um, I have to say that although Council Silver, Silva must have uh, voted no, but he did vote for the passage of the bond. So on one, he vote no, on the other one, he voted yes. And we did have it uh, broken down. We had 45% we were going to use for streets and road improvement, 35% for economic development, and 20% for facility improvements. In fact, at the last Dominici Institute, they talked specifically about the need to invest in infrastructure, and I felt that that was something there that really validated what the city is doing. Ms. Ortega, you, you've mentioned a couple times that things should be put to a vote. Um, how do you, in a representative democracy, how do you, um, I mean, obviously there are most of these decisions that, that have to be made by a counselor. Um, so how do you reconcile that with, with your um, desire to, to have voters weigh in? it seems like individually on so many different issues. Well, I, like we had talked about earlier, the big issues, those are definitely the ones that the voters should have an input on. Minimum wage was being one of them, and the GRT. The other thing, yes, I understand at local, that they have to make decisions right there and then, but on those, the big topics, the people need to have a voice. Okay. Yeah. I apologize, we're going to have to pause tape what for our hailstorm. <laughs> <laughs>
Mayor, in addition to uh, road and energy efficiency improvements, the city is planning to spend a significant portion of GRT money on funds to boost local businesses. Among the concerns expressed by some economists include the fact that incentives are often given without a rigorous evaluation and may favor one industry or individual business over another. What steps, in your view, if any, should the city take to prevent this? Well, just yesterday, or a couple days ago, Mavida, our Mesilla Valley Economic Deve Development Alliance, had, was going over their year-end numbers, and one of the things that they were talking about is the fact that they're running out of space to, uh, spec speculation space for companies when they want to move here. Uh, Santa Trace is almost full, and uh, Davin was kind of hinting more or less that the city would be, would be nice if they could, if we could help them invest and be able to bring in some more uh, companies here. Uh, frankly, I think that's something there that we should look at with this uh, as far as economic development is concerned. Recently, the city has had some successes here in the last three businesses that have come in. The last one being ARCA, uh, was in the aerospace industry, uh, $52,000 a year jobs, over 120 when it's fully uh, operational. Uh, one of the things that I would look at, one of the things that I've mentioned at the uh, council is a two to one ratio. So if we spend a dollar, we should get $2 back. Okay, Mrs. Ortega, your thoughts on this? Well, that's an, a question that I would also, you know, how do you pick who you help and who you don't help? Uh, we've been in business 10 years and just talking to other small business owners, I've never seen any of us get any kind of benefit from the city. So yeah, so that's an interesting question. I would like to know as well, you know, how do you determine who you help and who you don't help? Okay, Councillor Silva. Well, I've yet to see a study or any type of research uh, presented to us that says that we need more warehouse space. I know Mavita has talked about it, but I've yet to see anything come forth, and so it'd be very difficult to make a decision based with no research or evidence in front of me. Um, I do think that we need to be aggressive in assisting certain companies come here. We can do it through the JTIP program, um, through uh, other state programs such as the LIDA program. but. Uh, at present, I, I've yet to see anything that says that we should be assisting companies on that level. Okay, so. okay. all right, thank you. Um, uh, this is for Mrs. Ortega. As a small business owner, what specific steps do you think that the city government should do to bring more companies to Las Cruces? It kind of uh, comes off of this other statement, but are there things from your perspective that the city could be doing since you feel right now that they aren't really helping local businesses? Um, well, first of all, when we opened our business, it took us almost two years to get open. Mm -hmm. um, that's ridiculous. A, a person that is going to open a business, you go in there, you need to get those doors open to make money. Uh, you don't have two years. And I thought it was something that maybe we just experienced. And we've been in business, it'll be 10 years in March. So this is obviously, if we'd have been open any sooner, we might have been in business almost 12 years. So I think by the city re-looking at, you know, all the I's that need to be dotted and all the T's need to be crossed, it shouldn't take two years. That now opens my eyes to this is probably why we don't have other businesses coming to Las Cruces because of all the red tape that people have to go through. So what in particular might, might you suggest that the city council do and what will you fight for as a member of the city council? Uh, Reevaluating the process of whatever it took that they were holding us up with. I know that we ran into the inspector issue was the one we had. Uh, we would do what we had to do. Inspector number one would come in. He would find what we needed to fix. You'd bring the plumbers in. The plumbers like, we, need, we don't need to do this. We deal this all the time. But they went ahead and fixed it because city requested it. You get an inspector. Now you have inspector number two that comes out that has different issues than inspector number one. I'm like, are we not working in the same building? Can we not communicate? Okay, so you think communication is Yes, I, I believe it's lack of communication or training. I'm not sure. And uh, Councilor Silva, your thoughts on, on what the city could do better? Well, definitely we could we need to secure our base and help the small businesses that are opening up right now um, that process of uh, the permitting process has been you know, a hindrance for too long and that's going to be my job one after being elected mayor is to address that and move it along and, and improve the process um, also i think we need to be better advocates uh, at large and we need to really tie in with the regional development uh, down in the borderplex just south of us if we're going to recruit companies to this area um, I know that the mayors of Juarez and El Paso, they immediately went on trade missions to other areas to help recruit companies to this area, and they've also been to the Midwest as well. Okay. Um, I, um, think, I think our as mayor needs to be a bigger advocate for this area. Okay, thank you. And mayor, do you think this is fair criticism, that, that you, the city's not working with the city, uh, with local businesses? I mean, 
based on what, what you're hearing. Oh, absolutely. That's why last month the city uh, hired its first business liaison. Uh, his job is to help business people navigate through the city's permitting process and also enhance our economic uh, gardening uh, opportunities. Uh, also, I'd like to see the city continue to work with New Mexico State, uh, PSL, Johnson Space Center uh, in, in developing our aerospace uh, industry. Uh, as I mentioned, Ar ARCA just came here to town and they bring that type of business that we'd like to see, those type of high paying jobs. And then also working with our friends there, uh, Doniana County and Santa Teresa transportation facilities, that's huge. Okay, thank you, Walt. Uh, next question is for Mayor Miyagashima. Um, for several years, residents living next to the Las Cruces Country Club had wanted that to see that area converted into a premier park or a green space in the middle of downtown. Instead, it's going to be used for a hospital complex. Um, do you believe that the city did all it could to try to make that into a, a, a premier park? And do you support the, the use that is going forward right now? Yes, I do believe that the city did everything we possibly could. I helped lead that charge. I was supportive of the green space. And one of the things, and I've had couple meetings on that one of the goals was to try to um, under, have, have the residents understand that in order to make this viable a portion of this would have to have been sold for commercial purposes and then the other amount would be used to purchase the property and then of course then the city's gonna have to come up with the maintenance of it we just wasn't able to do it the best we could do was gonna, a very small offer that they uh, did not accept and it had to move forward in this in this direction as a hospital Ms. Ortega your thoughts about uh, what has happened to that that what used to be the country club property uh, and building my platform, I've been speaking to a lot of people, and that was one of the subjects that did come up. They wanted to know why did the city not acquire that. It was a perfect place. It was already park looking. The trees had already grown. Um, so why didn't the city? As far as do I believe the city did all that it possibly could have, I do not believe so. Once again, I was not part of a lot of the meetings that they did have, but how the subject did come up that it was brought to the people, I don't believe a lot of people were in on that one as well. If people are asking me now that I'm running for mayor, you know about these questions obviously they were not informed either. Councilor Silva I believe that's in your district if I'm correct. Right. Um, your thoughts on how that that has all played out and and moving forward uh, there's been some concerns expressed about the, the competition that this hospital will give the existing hospitals your thoughts about all of that? Well the first question to answer it is no I don't think we did a very good job at acquiring or doing or making it a green space. I was a part of a lot of those discussions. Um, I don't remember the mayor spearheading anything at all other than we had private sessions because it was a real estate transaction. Uh, the paltry offer we only offered one million dollars for that. I mean it was really an embarrassment offer I thought. Um, I thought we could have done much better and unfortunately uh, it didn't occur that way. Um, what it has transpired to, um, I think if they, as long as they offer good quality health care, I think we, it will be an asset to the community. Okay. Mrs. Ortega, recently some residents, business owners, and others have suggested that it is okay for the city council to reject zoning requests to prevent large businesses from coming to town, thereby protecting smaller businesses. Is this appropriate in your view, yes or no, and why? Well, if the city is doing that to actually prevent businesses from coming in, no. But it, it, unless we find out what the details are of why they prevented the zoning issues, then that would be a different. But yeah, but to just say that they're going to deny them because it's a big company that's coming in, okay. I don't, yeah, I don't believe that that. Councillor Silva. Again, you're talking about private land use there, and I know it gets very tricky legally what we can and cannot do in regards to zoning. I don't think we should be preventing it. Um, in the case of the Walmart that came into or was going to acquire a, a piece of land, uh, we were looking at safety issues and that was a major concern in regards to that particular project. Okay, Mayor. Exactly, the city doesn't uh, just deny any type of zoning. They have to have what they call a finding of the fact. And in that case, it was traffic issues, it was a hazard and safety issue to the uh, general welfare of the public in that vicinity. Okay. For Silva, you voted against a zoning change. Oh, oh well, we're right on there. Um, <laughs> um, that's right. That's right. It's that's a follow-up. That's a follow-up. <laughs> okay, it's a follow-up question. Um, so, are there any other existing business in town that you would permit from expanding in this in this particular way? So, are you, are you pretty much open to? No, not at all. Um, no. Okay. And, and can I do? You, yeah. you had what said you at the do? time that your concern about the Walmart moving in on Valley and Teixeira was changing that, the nature of that property from agricultural 
Does that mean that you would oppose any other businesses coming into that area as well? No, I wouldn't oppose any other businesses coming in. In fact, if you looked at the Walmart project and if you look at some of the smart growth principles in terms of building livable, walkable neighborhoods, uh, a store of that neighborhood, I mean, it was going to be a neighborhood Walmart, it was going to be a full-blown Walmart, I think it could have had the potential to have the perfect fit, but that was never uh, presented to the council. Okay, I'm sorry, Sylvia. Okay, no, that's fine. Um, so, uh, anything you'd like to add as far as changing the nature of uh, parcels uh, in the valley floor from agricultural to, to commercial? If, if I could just uh, touch on that sure. earlier question, uh, it was never disclosed to us that it was a Walmart. Uh, I know that name has been tossed around, but we were never told it was a Walmart. We, but we were just understanding that based on the information that was provided is how that decision was brought up. Mm -hmm. So getting back to, I'm sorry, the question. Just the, the idea of the, the, the nature of changing some zonings from commercial or from agricultural to commercial well, here if it's Well, if it's a privately owned parcel, person who has uh, land that's mm -hmm. zoned agriculture and they want to get out of the business and they want to uh, sell it, I think it's their right to. Mm -hmm. Okay. Anything to add? No. Okay, thank you. And I know uh, this isn't my question, but I just a real quick follow-up, Ken. Would you have voted the same way, presuming it wasn't Walmart? Well, it all depends on the traffic. And for example, obviously an office isn't going to generate the traffic of, say, a, a mega store. Right. And so because the information that we've got as far as how the road, to sure road was, uh, to, to sure road can't handle, can only handle so much traffic. So if it had been, say, an, uh, an office complex, well, that's different than a than a, if it was a Walmart. Again, I've, we were never disclosed to us that it was Walmart. It's been much speculation to that effect, right. but it was never disclosed that. And so. all of the debate on that was what impact that would have on local businesses. So wh while that wasn't officially that, the discussion, yeah. that was what the debate was about. Yeah. So anyway, we'll move on to the next question. Uh, and this is for Ms. Ortega. Um, impact fees have been a source of contention, uh, with some c claiming that they're needed to protect longtime residents. Uh, to make sure they're not asked to pick up the cost for new developments. Other people argue that that stifles growth. Uh, I know Mayor, or, I'm sorry, Councilor Silva, when we get to you, you have said that that was, you think, the, the biggest mistake that the, the city has made in, a, in, in another forum. You made that, that point. Uh, uh, Ms. Ortega, what are your thoughts about how you balance uh, impact fees and, and making sure that people who have lived here for generations aren't asked to pick up the bill for people just now moving here? Well, and in talking to, once again, like building my platform and talking to people, I did talk to some builders and hear what they had to say. And so I'm hearing now the other side of the story because I heard the side of the story that basically it's all falling on the residents that already live here and now we're responsible to foot the bill. And in talking to the builders, I, I now heard another side of the story. And from what I hear, it sounds like they're getting the short end of the deal. Um, yes, they understand that they have impact fees that they probably should pay, but the amount that they're having to pay is they believe it's, it's ridiculous. So, and, I mean, I'm not very familiar with the impact fee, the whole mm -hmm. story. So in hearing both sides, I mean, just hearing what I've heard from the builders, it doesn't sound like they're, they're getting a good end of the deal. Councilor Silva, the impact fees that you objected to in the other forum were eventually rescinded by, by the city. The, 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 the fees as they stand right now, do you think they're about right or do you think that they should be, be well, uh, I think amended? The, I think the ones, what, what we finally settled upon was safety ones to build the, the fire and safety complex out on the east, uh, uh, on, east Simone, on East Sonoma. So yes, I think that that one is needed because you definitely need safety. But in regards to the ones that were prior, uh, that were applied prior, yes, I did say that there, it was one of the worst pieces of legislation because if you paid, if you lived on, let's say, Delray, built a house, paid uh, impact fees versus someone up on Weinrich, you may never, if you're on Weinrich, you may never see a road being built in front of your house because you paid impact fees. So I don't think we, or I don't think as good a legislation was brought in, in front of council that could have been. Okay, and Mayor Miyagashima, this is something you've been wrestling with, I, I suspect, ever since you've come on. How do you try to balance that uh, so that uh, you're not stifling growth, but at the same time you're, you're, you're protecting longtime residents? Exactly. Well, nothing's free. There's got to be a way to have the roads, uh, sewer, public safety implemented without burdening the uh, taxpayer of uh, existing neighborhoods. I'm open, open to alternatives, and one of the things that I was trying to do uh, was with the road impact fee so that the developers as it is they already have to pay for the road they have to pay for 50 percent of the road and all we were suggesting is that 
all the property owners, much like this uh, special assessment district that's looking to be put through on uh, North Road, uh, Sonoma Ranch, be utilized with some type of model like that. So it's a fair process and you get the infrastructure put in at one time. Councilor Silva, uh, some argue we actually need to just revisit the commonly promoted idea that all growth is good, particularly since we live in the desert with a limited precious water supply. Explain your position on this and what changes in city policy are needed, if any. Well, I think one of the surveys that was brought before us in looking at the comprehensive plan is that a lot of the residents, they support infill practices. Um, I support infill practices in the, and if, in particular if we can do it in the older part of the city. But as we move out, as long as we're infilling within city limits, I think, and applying smart growth principles, being density, uh, that allows us to preserve the desert as well. So those are some of the practices and policies that I support. Mayor, your thoughts on this? Well, the, I th believe the question was about any growth, is, whether or not any growth is good. And uh, that's not good. Uh, Las Vegas, Phoenix, Arizona, uh, they were having exponential growth and look what happened to them. Their market fell out and property values dropped. Uh, that's what basically why I think I was elected mayor eight years ago. I think it's important to get a control on growth, make sure it's good, smart growth and something there that's sustainable. Uh, one of the things that we're also looking to do is balance the needs of the water, which we are very good in conservation. We're using less water today, 15% less today than we were uh, seven years okay. ago. Okay, Mrs. Ortega. Uh, the question was, uh, is all growth good? Um, no, all growth is not good. But once again, we need to, you know, we're not letting, allowing our city to grow. I mean, top 25 poorest city in the nation, uh, we're definitely not growing at all. Okay. So. Okay, um, Mayor Miyagishima, um and this kind of dovetails pretty nicely with uh, our, the previous conversation, but the county has proposed eliminating the extraterritorial zoning. So this is the zoning for right outside the city limits. And the city has a, a council representation on that. Would you support that change and why or why not? You know, that's been discussed for, gosh, over 25 years. Mm -hmm. And one of, the, one of the concerns with that, if you were to eliminate it, uh, would be the various people that were put into those type of uh, mm -hmm. requirements that, that if you were to remove them, what happens to them as well. Uh, I'd be willing to take a look at it, study it, and see if there was a way to slowly uh, phase it out. Mm -hmm. But just to go overnight and just say, we're gonna just do away with it, I think might be a little bit harsh. I think it's important to be fair to those who've been uh, subjected to those rules and regulations and somehow phase that in. Do you, do you think that, or do you agree with how the county is sort of going with its, its rezoning, for want of a better term, but just how they're zoning a lot of the areas outside of Las Cruces? Uh, Viva Doniana mm -hmm. is, is, a, is a project that I'm supportive of and one of the things that I like is that the input from all various stakeholders mm -hmm. again and that's something there that again I would like to be able to have a little bit more discussion with the current people who are, sit, reside within the ETZ mm -hmm. and let them know what is possibly coming. Okay. All right, and do you have any uh, sense? Of, I mean, it's a little bit of inside insider yeah. stuff. Of, yeah, know, and once ETZ. again, like, I'm not currently involved in that, but just hearing that how it's to eliminate it, and it's something that's been coming up for years, and it's something that we're barely looking mm -hmm. at now. This kind of makes me once again wonder, you know, question, you know, if it was something that was brought up years ago, why are we barely kind of looking at it now? So, mm -hmm. just on, from somebody looking look from the outside in. So, mm -hmm. and um, Castor Silva. Well, I presently sit on the ETZ board, and so. Uh, if you look at it, the original purpose of it mm -hmm. was so that we would have some type of uniform growth on the outskirts of the city in the uh, event that it would potentially be annexed into the city. So we're not just annexing mm -hmm. large tracts of either vacant land or uncontrolled growth, I should say. Um, also, at the time, I think 15 years ago, I don't know if the I don't know if the county. Uh, Staffing was at the same level as the city. I know that there were, you know, they've always struggled at the county with their staffing levels. So I think that is something that definitely is that something that come forth, uh, something that maybe both bodies, the governmental bodies, should consider. Okay, Councilor Silva, first question, or you get the first one on this. And I, I want to ask you about uh, city police and specifically the two explosive devices that went off uh, several weeks ago. Uh, on a Sunday morning uh, at two local churches. Um, the response to that has been, I, I think, that the, the city has been on edge uh, to some extent. There have been a number of reports since then of suspected explosive devices, including one just yesterday at Holy Cross Church where, where the first device went off. 
your, your thoughts about how city police are investigating and handling all this and um, are they going too far sometimes in, in you know, blocking off roads and evacuating buildings or, or are those necessary precautions, do you think? Well, I have the highest respect for our local police department and Chief Jaime Montoya. Uh, I do know that because uh, one of the devices when it was in a mailbox, now you have a lot of federal agencies involved. And so what little information I know because it's very, um, um, the department is handling, I mean, we're talking about information that can't be disclosed to the public for many reasons. Um, but as my understanding is that with the federal agencies involved, uh, a lot of progress has been, is being made. Uh, I heard rumor that there was one bomb that was uncovered in front of a church. It was intact. And that has given them many clues in regards to the other prior bombs. So it's unfortunate that we're having a lot of copycats uh, in, in this community. And I hope that we can catch the, uh, the original persons as soon as possible. Okay. Mayor Miyagashima, this is something obviously as mayor of the city, I'm, I'm sure you deal with every day. Uh, your thoughts on the progress that has been made uh, in investigating this case and um, uh, just the way the whole community has kind of responded to it. Sure. Let me just state that the city police and the sheriff's department deal with these types of calls and have had in the past. This isn't something new, so the city is, knows how to respond to uh, false alarms, of bomb threats. Because of the fact that the time that we, we're living in, it's been amplified. Uh, I will say that I had a safety meeting, and one of the reasons why I had that was to let the public know that the city police, the sheriff's department, uh, is doing what the federal guidelines or what the feds would like for us to do, so that's good. Also, it was a chance to share with the public some uh, ideas that they may not be aware of. So I feel that the city has been progressing well on this. Uh, as far as the investigation is concerned, I believe they're still moving forward on that and um, they're going through a lot of forensics, so that's all yeah. I'm aware of. Ms. Ortega, as, as you're talking to people in the community, what, what are you hearing about this incident and what are your thoughts? Oh, a lot of the people are concerned about public safety, so I think the original question was as far as public safety, can we go too far? No. I think when it comes to the public safety, you can never go too far. Okay, so, so concerns about evacuating buildings and closing off streets. Yeah, if that's what it takes, yes. I mean, you can't replace a life with any amount of, of money, so yes. Okay, great. Thank you, Walt. Mayor, I want to revisit the question of spending a GRT money on business incentives. Uh, considering that a portion of the GRT already goes to the spaceport for economic development, and there's a movement now to spend millions of dollars on a new city pool, what do you say to those who might argue that the GRT money would be better spent on quality of life initiatives, uh, a pool being one, but there could be many others, that may also at the same time boost economic development? Fred, I don't believe that the GRT money should be spent on incentives. Uh, one of the things that I'm looking at, it would be actually uh, bricks and mortar. Uh, for example, we're looking to help the university with the, their expansion of the hotel. Not that we would build a hotel, but we could add on to our convention center. And then the other thing would be um, buildings, as I mentioned, as far as Mavita needing some, some space, that the, the, you know, companies that want to move in, that there's not a lot of open space available. So we would actually own these type of structures. I wouldn't want to use it. Uh, to add to the pot, like for example, um, Lita, have they have their their funds, things of this nature. Uh, I, I support that. I'm not 100% sold that that you know because a lot of times there's a lot of businesses that use it five years later and then they leave. Okay, Mrs. Ortega. Uh, once again, in speaking to people and hearing what they had to say, a lot of the people were like, "Look at our roads. We are increasing this GRT, and if you look at most of the infrastructure in the city, it's some of them look like third world countries." So I believe that, you know, this money should have been earmarked as far as, you know, infrastructure, roads. Councilor Silva. Well, you mentioned that you made a comparison. Do we spend it on the spaceport, I think, and we, or do we spend it for economic development? Uh, if we look at, uh, and you mentioned a, a competitive pool, I think if we invest in items, quality of life, like uh, the competitive pool, or other infrastructure such as roads, that there is economic development for me in that persons would want to come to Las Cruces because we have those types of am amenities. So yes, I think we should seriously consider investing in a quality and quality of life projects, which I think in the long run will benefit uh, as for economic development. Okay. 
All right, and um, Mrs. Ortega, so you, you, you've been speaking with a lot of your constituents and, and folks around um, Las Cruces. So as a member of the city council, do you think that uh, you guys should be working to expand growth in Las Cruces, restrict growth, or maintain it to about where we are right now? Definitely, we need to expand growth. Mm -hmm. And, and how, how exactly would you try to do that? Well, I think once again, uh, in talking to a lot of people that are still encountering the, that we are not a business friendly mm -hmm. city. So these are already local people mm -hmm. that are here that would like to mm -hmm. open a small business. Mm -hmm. you know, every American's dream is to work for themselves, not really realizing how much work this is gonna take. So I think if we were to actually, once again, just become more of a business friendly city, we might actually have people that already live here. We're not bringing new growth to the city, mm -hmm. but these people might be able to open up their own business. And in long term, it's going to bring jobs and more money into the city. Okay. And uh, Councillor Silva, are we well, about right now where we're we should flat go? Growth, so yes. I, don't, I mean, where can we go <laughs> from here? You know, except for negative. No, I really think we again need to sit back and take an asset inventory of who we are as a community. Mm -hmm. um, we are a community that many many retirees like. Um, so I think we really need a mayor that's going to be an advocate, someone that's going to go out and market and promote Las mm -hmm. Cruces, and bring people to Las Cruces. And with that, we're going to spur in a lot of other types of job, oppor and job opportunities, such as you know finance, uh, the medical community mm -hmm. of support services. So um, I think there's a lot of opportunities that we just take an asset inventory of where we're at now and what we can build off of. Okay. And Mayor? Yes, I support good growth. Uh, I'd like to see us grow at about a 2 to 3% net growth per year. I think it's important that a city continue to grow. I mean, that obviously lends itself to economic development. Also, I want to see us expand on our aerospace that we have currently have right now, aerospace uh, partners with NMSU, PSL, White Sands Missile Range. Those are the type of high paying jobs that I want to bring here to the, continue to bring here to the city of Las Cruces to raise the, the, the economic uh, uh, proudness of, of, our, of our residents. Okay. okay. Uh, Mayor, I want to start with you on this one. Um, there was an effort um, over the last uh, year to recall three of your fellow city council members. Um, as you watched, and, and it was ultimately not successful, but as you watched all of that play out, um, I, I guess what are your thoughts on that and do you think that that ordinance needs to be changed at all um, to be more like the county to where there has to be actual um, charges or, or reasons? To sure. Call somebody. You know, I smile at that because I can still remember when I was about ready to push the button when I said, you know what, I don't believe in this recall and you might as well add my name to it. And um, I didn't know what it would take to recall me, but all I knew is what they were trying to do was wrong. My colleagues, Councillor Silva as well, are, are good, hardworking people. They're honest. They, they do they want the best for the city. Uh, and, and these three councillors really did not deserve to be recalled. And, and so I did not support it. Would I support changing the, mm -hmm. the uh, an ordinance to tighten it up a little bit? Absolutely. Okay. Ms. Ortega, what, what are your thoughts about how that all played out, and would you support a, a change to the, the current ordinance? Um, well, in talking to people, once again, I heard people say, I heard the opposite side, how Mr. Miyagashima heard that, you know, they're honest people that are representing the city of Las Cruces. I heard from the people that felt like these three people needed to be recalled. Um, I wasn't part of, you know, wanting these people to be recalled, the people were not in my, in my district, so yeah. I, I guess the question though is, do you think just not liking the way they voted on certain issues is reason enough to, to, to launch a recall, or should, should that be tightened up so that there has to be something more than that? It should probably be tightened up a little bit, so yeah, because just the way somebody votes, yeah, definitely no. Okay, Councillor Silver. Thank you. Before I, I answer that question, I want to thank the mayor for the endorsement of honest and hardworking. Thanks, mayor. <laughs> <laughs> Duly noted. <laughs> I think it should be changed. Uh, just to recall someone because of you know, differences of some sort or something a uh, elected official may have done, that's not enough. And I would agree with, I, I don't know the county ordinance word for word, but I think there needs to be some type of malfeasance or something uh, for that person to do before they're recalled. Kind of a, a related question in the sense that the recall uh, election attempt cost a lot of money. And uh, there's concern in general about special interest money in politics today. As a result, as you all are aware, Common Cause New Mexico is promoting the idea of public financing 
for campaigns in Las Cruces. This is not a new idea. A lot of uh, cities uh, have implemented this or are looking at this. And Mrs. Ortega, I want your thoughts on this. What do you think about the idea? I actually did meet with a gentleman that is part of the Common Cause. He came to explain because he said it'll be something that's coming up on December the 14th. And he wanted everybody that was going to be involved or possibly involved to know a little bit about it. And from what he explained to me and from what he showed me, the email that he sent me, uh, it actually sounds like a pretty good thing. But once again, it's something that the, the, the constituents are going to be responsible for. Should we go to Common Cause? This is now money that once again the taxpayers are going to be responsible to, to help foot the bill. So once again, it would be something that I believe that the constituents would need to have input. Um, but I, it does sound like it does level the, the playing field for anyone that would want to run that maybe couldn't afford to run. Okay. Councillor Silva, your thoughts? Yeah, I believe Albuquerque and Santa Fe have some, some type of public uh, financing. Um, I also believe that it should come before the constituents because uh, in the long run, it is going to be the taxpayers that are going to be footing the bill or paying the bill in regards to public financing. So I think it's something that we need to study very carefully. Mayor. Yeah, I support public financing. As time goes on, campaigns are becoming more and more expensive. And because of the way the economy is throughout the nation, it's very difficult for people to come up with those large sums of money that these political action committees can, can meet. Uh, I, I feel this levels the playing field and something that I would support. Um, uh, Councillor Silva, this is a, 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 I'd just like to ask you a little bit about the downtown re redevelopment that's going on and mostly that really affects the district that you are in currently. Do you think that that's a good way for the city to, to um, push forward um, quality of life issues, economic development issues? Do you think that you guys are headed in the right direction with how you guys are, are redeveloping downtown? Yes, I do. And the downtown development has been a series of what we call catalytic uh, moments or events. Mm -hmm. uh, opening up the, the entire Main Street was one of them. And we did it in three phases. And I think I, you know, I go down downtown quite a bit. I sit downtown, I see the traffic that's flowing. Um, now you're seeing the plaza come forth. And I think once the plaza come forth, we're going to have a focal point for downtown. Um, there's always, already talk of different businesses that want to move into the downtown area. Mm -hmm. If you look at the one restaurant uh, or the few, there's a two or three restaurants that have moved in the downtown area and they've been pretty successful. So um, I think more private investment coming into the downtown area and with the government or with the city uh, investing, um, that's going to be a project that's going to be flourishing here and, and more and more as we move forward. Okay. Um, Mayor? Yes, I support our downtown efforts. I believe we're moving in the right direction. Uh, one of the things that we're looking to do is expand to help bring in more venues that uh, both young people and, and those not as young would like to enjoy. And then, of course, when you start seeing that, then you're going to start seeing some different types of facilities, different types of housing that are going to be in play. And when those come in, then you're going to have some more businesses, and it's just a domino effect. I believe we're right there, and we see nothing but positive things coming of our de uh, downtown development. Great. And Mrs. Ortega, um, this is not in your district. This is just far away from where, or not that far away, but so do you think that a, an emphasis just on downtown is a detriment to the other parts of the city or is it helpful? Um, once again, in speaking to different people and hearing what they had to say, I've had several people that actually brought up that, you know what, the downtown revitalization, this is the third time the city's done it. You know, the city used, to, the downtown used, uh, downtown used to be open, we closed it. Downtown was open again, we closed it. Down, how many times do you have to open up downtown. A lot of people that I spoke to said once we do this we may as well go to the local cemetery and revitalize the dead. A lot of people have just felt like this was not money well spent. Okay, well fair enough. Okay, Ms. Ortega, I want to start, it's sort of a similar question, but I want to focus on El Paseo and, and also the Amador area that uh, was just brought up. El Paseo, there, there was an initiative started about three years ago where we had been selected by the federal government and there was going to be this revitalization effort on El Paseo. As we look at that today, the, the Kmart's closed down, the Pro's Ranch market's closed down, and it, it certainly has not been revitalized. Uh, there was an announcement just a couple weeks ago that we're going to now have a similar effort in the Alameda area. Um, I, I guess my question is, how much faith do you have when, when these things get announced that two or three years later, there will actually be the improvements that, that we're hoping for? Well, see, once again, I mean, uh, there's nothing downtown, there's nothing on El Paseo. Everything has moved either towards Telshore or actually moving up further on Loman. 
Um, just looking at the city right now, there's nothing on El Paseo. I, I, once again, it's bringing, if we're going to revitalize the Kmart area, El Paseo, we may as well go to the cemetery and revitalize all the people that have passed because it's, it's dead. There's nothing there unless something big were to come in, you know, maybe into that Kmart, maybe something that is a family friendly place. You know, a lot of people have brought that up. Why don't we put something in there that could be a family friendly business? Mm -hmm. You know, but if we're not a family, if we're not a friendly business environment, we're not going to get anybody to come in. So. Councillor Silver, are, are we dead? Are these just uh, <laughs> hopeless causes? I think the difficulties and the challenges that I've, I've had, in particular with the El Paseo, is sometimes we bring ideas and projects from other areas thinking that that's the magic pill that will revitalize that area. Um, one of them is road dieting for El Paseo. And my biggest question is when you look at curb to storefront, it's a big difference than somewhere like in, on Mill Street in Phoenix when you have the curb to the storefront which is only 10 feet, you park at the curb. Uh, Picacho has a very similar feature like that. So I, I would support more like on El Paseo or in some of these projects that we study them more and why don't we tailor something that I think is, would work more for us than it would for other areas. Okay, uh, Mayor Miyagashima, that, why, why do you think El Paseo has, has not taken off like we thought it would and, and do you have higher hopes for, for Alameda? First, let me just say that what you were talking about was a $2 million grant and that grant wasn't for any type of infrastructure, it was more of a planning. Mm -hmm. It was to, to see how when the time come and the, the uh, movement between say the university and, and El Paseo was to come to fruition. So that's what that was for, I just wanted to clarify that. Um, the other thing, as far as Amador Proximo, is, is similar. It's, it's, it's something there to put a plan into place. And I, I, I want to refer to the town of El Paso and their downtown area. They had to have a plan first, and then I'm not suggesting that we build a baseball stadium, but these are the very things that you lay the foundation. This is what these grant monies are for. So in the event it was to move forward, this is what it would look like. Okay. And that about wraps it up. We're out of time. I want to thank all of the candidates for joining us and continuing the dialogue about the municipal election in Las Cruces with this mayoral debate. I also want to thank my colleagues and friends here from the Las Cruces Sun News for partnering with us on this debate and also uh, the Sun News editorial board meetings. Next week, uh, the Sun News editorial board meeting will focus on Council District 2. And I also want to thank our members because without you, uh, we would not be able to bring you programming like this. So thank you. If you haven't become a member yet, you can do that online at krwg.org. Have a great week.